Good morning to all of you. Good afternoon to me. I want this to be wine, but in, in <laughs> the spirit of <laughs> sisterhood, I am drinking afternoon tea. So you all were here to visit us uh, almost a year ago. We're coming right up on it um, after the Dallas VoucherCon. How the world has changed since. So I thought it'd be fun to talk to you and see, you know, what's going on with you and, and various updates, um, just because now that we're together again, it would be fun to find out. So let's see, Emma, where are you living? Are you living in Melbourne? I am. I'm in Melbourne, um, very much in my house. <laughs> we've, been, we've been locked down for almost uh, oh, most of the last seven months, so I'm getting to know my four walls <laughs> really well. <laughs> I keep up with you because I have a nephew married to um, uh, a, a woman from Perth, but they live in Melbourne with their kids, and he just celebrated oh, that, his birthday, but he said it wasn't too much of a celebration since they were They'd be school. better off being in Perth, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Well, but Sir Larry and I were talking before you came on that in a way, Melbourne is almost like I am, you know, the village in Northern England that when the plague came, locked yeah. itself down. Um, why is why is Melbourne so hot? Is it because it's a port? Um, it, it, bad luck, mainly. Um, look, it's a big city. We're like five and a half million people, so it's going to take off anywhere. It's, it was probably going to be Sydney or Melbourne. Um, we had a super spreader event with a hotel quarantine, and um, yeah, things just went off basically. Yeah, so a little bit bad luck, a little bit mismanagement. Well. I won't even comment about how it is in the United States. <laughs> let's, move on, let's move on to Perth and catch up with Durba. What's going on in Perth? Oh my God, Barbara, we feel we feel almost embarrassed because we're we're so spoiled here. And um, we we got um, we went into pretty tight lockdown quite early. Our premier was quite um, clear about what he wanted, and he wasn't afraid to kind of put lay the law down. So it shut down very quickly, and we have no community transmission. We haven't had any community transmission for months. So life here is fairly normal, um, except for the fact that borders are closed. So you can't come into Western Australia unless you're Western Australian or you have an exemption. And if you are Western Australian, you want to come home, you have to get one of the very rare flights that are available and then you have to go into a two week supervised quarantine. So it isn't easy for people in that situation, but what it does mean is that for everybody who's living here permanently, um, I mean, the kids are in school, we're going to supermarkets, restaurants are open, life is just normal, other than the fact there's this insanity going on all around us and there's no way to remove yourself from that completely. I mean, we're all conscious of what's happening in the world and it's, it's just an ever-present thing, you know? I do. We were talking to Rose Carlisle last night from New Zealand, who has a wonderful new book out called A Girl in the Mirror. And New Zealand has been hugely successful. Um, you know, the island bit helps. And then yep. they, they also were really tight. This is the time when American individualism is really not an asset. Uh, but we'll, we'll pass on. So, Sue Ari, what's going on up in the mountains? Uh, well, in the mountains, uh, I suppose this is our second disaster. COVID. Um, and uh, I was speaking to someone yesterday and we were just saying, um, you know, after after the bushfires, COVID's a walk in the park. And for us, it has been because we're rural and we're away from the cities. Really, it's it's a bit like Dervla was saying, it's pretty much life as normal. We are aware of things and there are no large gatherings. Um, but, uh, but generally, you know, it's pretty much pretty much the same, except that you try not to cough in public uh, because everyone looks at you. <laughs> well, I mean, that was sort of good hygiene anyway. So I don't know. That's a huge difference all the way around. So I know there are exciting things that are going on with all of you in terms of books and so forth. So let's see, let's go back to Durbla so it's not just like a clock here going on. Um, you, you have done some really interesting changes since last I saw you. What, what's the news? Is, this, is it me, me Barbara? Yep, it's you. Um, oh, gosh. Ooh, so much and so little in a kind of a way. I mean, some things have changed. Um, I signed a big deal with HarperCollins uh, for a global thing. They were just publishing me in Australia before, and now it's more of a global thing. So I'm writing three books for them, and I'm writing some shorts for Audible, um, which is a lot of fun. So 
that's the biggest change, but it doesn't make any impact on day-to-day -day life, which is still the same. I mean, you're still just going about your business, which is uh, looking after children, because even you might like to put them second, but they don't allow that to happen. So they're <laughs> first. And then after that, it's writing. So trying to get my book where I want it to be um, and trying to make that fit around the demands of everyday life. Yeah, but if you have children in school and not actually at home, that's a break compared. I've talked to a lot of British authors and they're having a very hard time balancing childcare and writing. It's not fun. I mean, we, we had uh, about three months of, um, of, lock, of uh, homeschool here because I'm immunocompromised. So before schools closed here, I had our kids out and it was, uh, it was a delight. I mean, Kenny, my husband was working from home. So I did homeschool in the morning and he did homeschool in the afternoon. And then slowly that afternoon shift started moving later and later, later. And suddenly I was doing homeschool. I was like, how did this happen? But the funniest thing was when the kids were going back to school, at one point, my little boy wasn't particularly happy in his, in his school. And there, was, there were some long involved conversations about what we were going to do. And I said to him, you know, Kenny and I had a long talk. How would we manage this? But we'd offer him homeschool for six months, thinking he would jump at it, you know. And uh, he just said, no, he, he'd miss his friends. But before we even got to that, I, I, I was announcing this thing to the family. And my little girl, who's 11, just went, me, mom? And I said, no, honey, you'll go to school. And she went, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Which says a lot for my homeschool skills. I was really proud of myself. I thought I was killing it, but, but not, obviously, at all. Maybe your strength is writing and not teaching, who can say. Yeah, I think so. Right. Yeah, Emma, um, what's up with you? Do you have a new book in the works or a new book actually out? Yeah, well, I've, my, the, the, oh, whoops, just knocked my computer. Um, my last book uh, in the Caleb Zellick series is out most places in the world, but not in America yet. So that's Darkness for Light. Although some, some people seem to be able to track it down. That, that's because of COVID. That was put off until next year. And it, I'm now writing the fourth book in the series, um, which will be out next year, probably in Australia. And then I guess there's going to be a delay with America as well. Um, so I'm busy killing off characters at the moment. Uh, <laughs> and also rewriting madly because I, I, I decided on the setting about four years ago. Um, and part of the setting is, I cannot believe this, in an old quarantine hospital, which is actually based on a real old quarantine hospital in Victoria, like just down the road from me, um, which I, I went to, you know, years ago. It's also sort of sitting on an island. Um, and, and through the whole manuscript, I've got things like viruses and, you know, like just as a metaphors and that. And I've had to just tone that down and down and down because it just really feels on the nose at the moment. So all my beautiful metaphors are just gone. <laughs> Um, so yeah, thanks COVID. That's another thing. More rewriting. <laughs> Could you be a little more detailed about your series for people who don't know it? What's the name of the first book? So the first book is Resurrection Bay um, and it, uh, they all center around uh, a deaf uh, private investigator or fraud investigator, Caleb Zellick. So some people call it the Caleb Zellick uh, series. So Resurrection Bay um, starts pretty much with um, Caleb holding his, the body of his best friend who has been brutally murdered. Um, and the series pretty much gets um, worse and worse for Caleb as it goes along. Although I must say in Darkness for Light, which is the third book, um, things are look, looking on the up because he's trying to, uh, he's got a new motto, which is um, make good decisions. Um, and well, I'll, I'll leave it up to the imagination of how well that goes down in, in a crime novel. <laughs> Okay, so sorry, I know what you're up to, but um, the rest of them may not. So what should we talk about? Letters from Leo, or do you want to go back and- Oh, yeah, us? Letters from Leo. Okay. Uh, letters from Leo, I probably remember better than any of the other books because I've just finished it. Right, me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, Letters is uh, the book that, um, Late last year, I, I received a, a grant from the Copyright Fund um, to, to write a book. So despite bushfires and, um, and COVID and everything else that was going on, it was actually a great motivator. I had to get it in um, by, by the end of September uh, because I had taken the money. And, uh, and so uh, Letters from Leo is a, another metafictional thriller. And I adored writing it. I always have this sense of 
guilt when I write standalones in a funny sort of way because I, I'm constantly getting um, letters from the Rolly fans demanding to know when the next Rolly book is coming out. Um, and I have to say to them, well, yes, soon, uh, as I finish this book. Uh, letters from Leo is, um, I, I suppose, would you call it a suspense thriller, metafiction? I have a really hard time uh, classifying it, but it, it basically um, follows a, a writerly correspondence uh, where one of the correspondents isn't all that he appears to be, um, as well as a, a second thread, uh, which is the story of a young writer who's doing a, a writer's residence in Boston. Um, and she, she's an Australian living in America. And I, I find that for me, it's, it's easier to write expatriates in America when I want to write an American book um, because I can get the voice of Australians really easily and mm -hmm. I have to work much harder to get the voice of Americans. Um, and so I tend to ground with at least one Australian wandering around the new world, uh, making friends with Americans. Uh, so that's basically a sketch of what, I, what I'm up to. That book has just um, gone out and I'm in that period of waiting to see if it'll find a home. Um, I hope that it will since we both put a lot of work into it. So I'm really lucky that I get to edit Suari's work um, in and it's always a joy to work with her. But I, I do find it interesting that Boston has attracted you so because your 10th role in Sinclair was also in Boston. I wonder, <laughs> why Boston, you know, compared to like well, any other American city? Uh, well, I haven't been to Boston, but I do have a friend, Larry Vincent, who's an American writer. And uh, he, he had, he attended Harvard and he knows Boston really well. And so when I set a book in America, I make sure that I have a link to someone who can check the details for me to make sure that I have got all the details of place correctly. Um, and so that's why both Roland went to America and uh, Letters from Leo is, uh, sorry, but Roland went to Boston and Letters from Leo is set in Boston um, so that I had an expert in the city who could uh, make sure that I was getting the roads and the restaurants and the, the general feel and those little bits of local nuance and detail that actually make a, a story sit in place properly. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that's the reason. It was just a purely, purely practical reason, though now um, I've almost talked myself into love with Boston uh, by writing two books there. Um, so it'll have to, once this plague is over, it'll be one of the first places on my list to visit. Well, I hope you will find it as charming as the city that you write about. So one of the things, um, we launched Ian Rankin's last book last Sunday, and one of the, um, one of the things we talked about was translating Scottish English into American English, and whether, whether one should, and if one does, what are the key words? that Americans will truly stumble over. And we came up with a few. I'll give you an example, tenement. I'm from Chicago, um, outside Chicago. And for me, tenement is what the British call council housing. And mm -hmm. in Edinburgh, it can be luxury flats. So <laughs> it's a tremendous difference. And, um, and he left it as tenement, but, but he did put in enough context so that you could figure it out. Um, but uh, a couple of other words I thought were tricky. So how do you feel about that? Um, Emma, when you're writing, do, are you, and you sell a book to another country, do you have any thoughts about whether it should just stand the way you've written it? Or, or is it annoying if another country's publisher changes it? Yeah. So, so far, no English speaking countries have changed anything. Um, I don't know about the translations, but not being able to read in those well, languages. I'm so that, that would be interesting. Yeah, that would be yeah, really interesting. I, I should have um, just limited it to English. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I yeah. Polish well, might throw you. Right. It's a good, it's a good point though, because you don't know what's happening in translations. Um, I try very hard not to be mentally influenced by the fact that it's going to be read in different countries because I don't want to make my writing beige. 
So if you just make it all the one tone so that it can be, every single word can be understood, it just really does dull it down. Um, and and I'm, I'm definitely writing a world around me. I, I'm, I'm writing this interesting, colourful world. So I, I don't want to uh, dull it down. But there are times in the novel where um, let's say something really quite important is happening, either an action scene or a really emotional scene where I will try very hard not to make, uh, not to use words that'll make people go, what, what does that mean? And take them out of it. So if it's just in a general scene and I might uh, mention, say, uh, Caleb might be in a ute. Now, if you're in America, you might not know what a ute is, but from context, when I write it in, you're going to work out it's a, that it's a pickup truck. Right. If it's really important that you know instantly and I don't want to jerk you out of the scene, I will find a way around writing that. So, yeah, it very much depends on where I am in the scene. Um, also, dialogue is a really interesting thing because dialogue is my love. This is how I approach writing. I, I love writing dialogue. It's, and in fact, I almost write plays, the first draft sort of a play. Um, and I don't want to make that not believable either. So you've got to put enough context in around. But again, people are smart. They can work things out. No, I'm not a fan that. of translating them at all. Um, in fact, mm -hmm. we have done really well at the Poison Pen by bringing in books um, from other ling English language companies, countries, try it again, um, so that the American customers who buy them from us don't get a translation. We made a killing on Harry Potter in the English edition. <laughs> it, it was it was great. So Emma, um, what about you? And Faye, you're 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 Irish, are you not? Now living in Australia. Yes, I'm Irish, and um, the first three books are set in Ireland. They're set in Galway, the west coast, where I'm from. So <clears throat> I kind of had the luxury of just being in that really comfortable space. I think one of the things that people liked about the books is that they're they're a little bit without being Irishy, you know. <laughs> they are Irish, and the language and the dialogue is that way, and the descriptions are that way. So I could use the, the language I was comfortable with without without thinking outside of that. Nobody really seemed to stumble over it, except for the Irish first names, which mm. caused a lot of confusion with pronunciation. Ashling is not a, a name that travels that often, it seems, um, and it's spelled the Irish way, which is not easily pronounced if you're an English speaker. So that, that definitely um, gave rise to a few emails. The other thing that came up quite a few times was uh, language swearing, oh um, which Irish people just seem to be a bit more comfortable with. I'm not saying everybody goes around swearing like a drunken sailor, but uh, it's not unheard of. And it's not socially shocking if someone drops an F-bomb every now and again. Whereas I think in certainly in parts of the US that would not be that would not be okay. So I definitely have had a, quite a few emails where people are saying, I really like your books, but can you just stop with the swearing? And I'm like, where? I can't even see it. So <laughs> it's a cultural thing, I think. But I'm writing an American book at the moment. That has been a very different experience. And that had to be American because of the nature of the story. But um, I thought it was doing a really good job with American language. I've spent a few summers over there and obviously absorb a lot of American literature and books and TV and you think you know, but you, eh, mm. there's still some things you stumble yeah. over. And the thing that really surprised me in terms of feedback was um, my editor said, you're just making everybody way too friendly. We do not invite people into our homes like that. I mean, we just wouldn't do that. And I'm like, really? Because when I was in America, everybody was so friendly. And it, it finally occurred to me, you know, it's one of these blind privilege things that you just don't re recognize that you're getting special treatment because I was a young Irish girl with an Irish accent and people were interested and so I probably got a little bit more of that that welcome but I think that was common to all my friends because everybody always says you know Ireland of the thousand welcomes and Ireland's such a friendly country and we would say why do Americans think Irish people are so friendly because American people are so friendly but I don't think the experience is the same for everybody maybe um, so I've had to dial that back a little bit and that was that was the one that kind of took a while to wrap my head around. Well, it depends on where in America you are. Don't forget that editors live in New York City, which is notoriously unfriendly um, yeah. <laughs> because it's a big city and so forth. Whereas if you were in other parts of America, you would find it 
much more like Ireland. I mean, it's just so much bigger. There's so yes, much more yes, variation. Yes. But I'm really cracked up about your profanity thing. And I always think back to this wonderful moment. I had a Russian professor at Stanford. I loved him. His name was Ivan Ivanich Stenbog Fermor. And he was a white Russian that had escaped the revolution, because this is 1960, by coming from Vladivostok to San Francisco, where there's a big Russian population. And I really loved him and loved studying with us. But here was his weekend job on weekends. He went down to the Army Language School in Monterey where all the spies were trained and he taught profanity, <laughs> Russian <laughs> profanity, because, because, you know, if you really think about it, if you were going to go behind enemy lines to spy, you really had to swear, you know, <laughs> authentically. But we all just love the fact that that was his job description on the weekends. It was so funny. That is the best job I've ever heard of in my life. Was, I absolutely 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 if great. anyone in America needs to learn Australian swearing for spying purposes, just give me a call. <laughs> Find me on Twitter. I'm <laughs> an expert. <laughs> I wonder, you know, because I've talked to two or three writers um, now living in Australia uh, who are from the United Kingdom, uh, Michael Robotham from one, although I think he was Australian originally and then yeah. lived over there. And I'm trying to remember the name of a, a really nice woman who lives somewhere between north of Sydney. Anyway, um, and she's British. And, and I wonder how, um, how they do, you know, are they, are they writing... British novels? Are they writing international novels? Are they trying to write Australian novels? Because there, there are even big differences between Australian English and British English. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Michael mainly sets his books in England and uh, at least one in America. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, um, although, I mean, Jane Harp is an interesting one because she's from the UK and she writes Australian books. Um, so, yeah, everyone seems to do it slightly differently. Dervla yeah. needs to write books one in feel, Australia. Yeah, Jane's books feel very authentically Australian to me, but mm. I'm not Australian. But I mean, I, I remember the when she wrote The Dry, it felt to me, I mean, that was so convincingly of its place. And I, I think that seemed to be the consensus. I mean, most Australian commentators really felt it really captures that feeling of the outback. And um, so I think that it's a, it, it is a mix, as Emma says. I've got a friend, Sarah Foster, who's British, and she lives in Perth and has them there for gosh, 10 years plus, and most of her books are set in between. Some in the UK, some in Australia, mm. some in Indonesia, where she spent time. I guess it's wherever you find the story. I think, mm. um, I think the cultural differences between British and Australian are probably slightly less than the cultural differences between Australian and American. Mm. Um, there, there does seem to be a slightly, not a huge gap, but a slightly larger gap uh, in what um, what we assume mainly and that's where where I found the differences in American English and Australian English and uh, just uh, American perspective versus Australian perspective just our assumptions are slightly different mm -hmm. uh, and we seem to be closer to the UK than we do to America. Well there's a real trace of cockney in a lot of Australian um, speech pattern. I don't know if the words are so much that way, but but the accent yes. is, mm. is different. I've spent more time in New Zealand, actually, than Australia, and I always feel that New Zealand is like dropping back to the 1950s in England. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's, it's you know, they, they're picking up speed, I think, now. But in fact, it's so interesting that, you know, we're really talking about a globalization, aren't we, you know, of, because when I first went to Australia, which was, gosh, back in the 70s, I think it was, yeah. There wasn't really much of an Australian publishing industry at all. And I remember how stunned I was by the price of books. I mean, I, I went into a shop and a paperback was like $35 and I thought, seriously? And then, you know, they pointed out to me that the books came over from, from England by ship, you know. Um, there wasn't really a lot of local publishing, but now that's really changed, hasn't it? Yeah, it's hugely different, and and um, crime fiction in particular. So when I know when Resurrection Bay was first published, um, it was still before crime Australian crime fiction took off. It, it was just yeah. on the edge of it. So that was two thousand and fifteen, and within like six months, um, suddenly the international spotlight was on Australian crime fiction. Um, in, in fact, it was it was so different to the extent that when I was writing Resurrection Bay, I, I had a um, publisher who hadn't read it or anything, 
um, said, oh, don't write anything set in Australia. No one will publish it. Uh, and so that would have probably been 2014. Um, and yeah, 18 months later, um, there was this, oh, wow, Australian crime fiction. So I, I think the publishing industry here has really um, yeah, just exploded. I, I mean, hopefully, hopefully it'll recover from 2020. Um, but, it's, but it's certainly been feeling pretty vibrant. There was um, an announcement today about um, an Australian online, I think, book operation. I can't remember. My, my mind is a jumble at the moment. Um, and I thought that was really interesting, you know, that it was going to be contesting Amazon, so to speak. Oh, um, would that be Booktopia? Booktopia. Yeah, probably yeah. so. Right. Yeah, Booktopia thought, are great. Yeah, they've been around a while, yeah. yeah. Well, we've yeah. been lucky that we have had all of you. We've had at the store, we've had Jane Harper, we've had um, Sarah Bailey and mm -hmm. Candace Fox, who hilariously and totally by accident booked herself in on Friday night and James Patterson out of the blue booked himself in on Saturday night. And so, <laughs> so she went to the Tucson Book Festival and then drove all the way back to Phoenix in order to, you know, to, because she and Jim had just published a book together. So we, we've had a lot of visitors from Australia. I've been saying for the last two years that the Australian crime wave was going to be the next big thing and that Nordic Noir was quietly dying down some due to overexposure and that I thought Australian would come up. And it has a lot of echoes in America, especially Jane's books with the Outback, you know, it's like Westerns. Uh, and people, in fact, Ian said that he um, was really inspired reading Jane to think about um, Scotland, the north of Scotland is sort of the equivalent of the outback and, you know, the peat bogs and so forth, that that idea of getting out of Edinburgh and writing in big space was, um, you know, something that, that she showed him, but we're sort of used to that, um, yeah. you know, so it's, so it's different. So, so Larry, what's going on with Roland? We've talked to you about letters from Leo, but what's with Roland? Uh, well, book 11. Uh, I suppose, um, and he's back in Australia. So I, I try when he's, he always seems to wander around the world and uh, is away for a couple of books, but uh, I like to bring him back to Australia at least um, once every third book or, and, and keep him there for a couple of books. Uh, for no other reason than I miss writing in Australia. Um, as Dervla was saying when she was writing in Ireland, there's a, there's a kind of a, a naturalness about writing in a place that you know so well and where you understand all the nuances and you understand the climate and you uh, understand the, the landscape. And as much as it is exciting to take uh, a book overseas, it's like traveling yourself. It's always lovely to come home. Um, and so I'm really enjoying it. I've just started. Uh, writing book 11 um, and um, it's just it just feels like coming home um, and it also feels like catching up with old friends uh, because I have been writing a couple of other books in the in the past year so I've been away from Roland for about I think three books now. Yep. Um, and we've gone from Shanghai to Boston and now on this loop we're now back in Australia. What year are we in now? Because, you know, you're sort of quietly... 1936. You're yeah. in 36 well, by now? 36. 36. So, it, uh, so we're looking at, it's, it's the year, I mean, just generally 36 is the year of the, the Berlin Olympics. It's also uh, the beginnings of the Spanish Civil War. So there's a lot going on on the world stage, uh, but there's a lot going on in Australia as well. Um, so I, I quite like to set Australia within the world through these books. Uh, quite often because of Australia has been, you know, the, uh, the last outpost for so long, there's a tendency to look at our history in isolation from the rest of the world and in isolation from what was going on in the rest of the world. But, but um, what I kind of like to do is to draw the parallels and to have a look at Australia as a, uh, not so much a mirror, but a, a funny sort of um, bounce uh, of the of the waters of the rest of the world, because the, the picture does end up different here, and the, the light is different, and the, the attitudes are different, but it is 
um, in its own way a reflection. Um, and it allows, it allows you to almost have a distance when you're discussing what's going on in the rest of the world. Uh, take some of the heat out of it, but to actually in that way talk about the importance and the, the danger of, of what's going on uh, to audiences, hopefully not just in Australia, but everywhere. I have learned so much editing you. It's really embarrassing to think that how Eurocentric our view of World War II is, or the Asian theater, but um, in, in the 1930s, really, we're, we're before the war. Um, and I've just been fascinated to see that the same forces, you know, the, the far right, the left, the radicals, the, you know, the bigots, the, the whole bit, um, were just the same in Australia, but we don't think about it as much as we do about what was going on in Germany, so, mm -hmm. or the rest of Europe. So I'm fascinated. Durval, let's go back for those who don't know your books. Um, tell us a little bit about the reunion, which I have to say, one of my staff must have sold like 200 copies of it. Absolutely loved it. Oh my God, that's lovely to hear. Um, the Ruin is my first book <clears throat> and it's set in the west of Ireland and it, it, um, it was my first attempt at writing a novel and I had no idea what I was doing when I started. That was about 2014. I decided I would kind of write seriously, but I just had this idea. It wasn't even an idea for a story. It was more of a kind of a snippet of a scene and a character. And that's, that's what that book kind of came from and was built off. And it was all about Maud and Jack. Maud is a 15 year old girl and Jack was only five in the first scene of the book, which is kind of a prologue as it happens. And I could see them in my mind's eye. I knew that they were sitting in this crumbling country house in the middle of the Irish countryside, which we have a lot of, you know, these old Georgian houses that are crumbling into ruin. And um, this house was cold, it had no electricity. I knew they were sitting on the stairs and they were holding hands and I knew they were afraid. And I knew how Maud felt about Jack. I knew that she had just loved him from the moment he was born and that she'd been protecting him from everything that had come at them, but that now she wasn't sure if she was going to be able to protect him from what was coming. And I just knew Maud, you know, I just knew everything about her. I knew, I knew who she was just almost instinctively. What I didn't know was what had happened to bring them to that point, what was going to happen next. And most importantly to me, I kind of had a feeling she was going to make an enormous sacrifice for him. And what I wanted to know was what was going to be left for her afterwards, after she does all this, after she gives up so much for him, what is left for a person who has done that if they have to try and build a life for themselves afterwards? And that was kind of the question that was in my mind. And I remember having this exact conversation once, I think it was in Sydney with an editor and I was very seriously explaining all of this. And I said, you know, I really, I wanted to write the book because I wanted to tell Maud's story. And he said, well, you didn't. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, that's a fair point. Actually, I kind of didn't because it just became something different under my hand, you know, and um, the main body of the story ended up being Maud coming back many years later. And there was, you know, an investigation and the main character became someone else, became a, a, a cop, um, a detective called Cormac Riley. And I realized in the writing of the book, I needed a detective. I needed someone who could ask these kinds of questions and do things that I'd originally imagined Maud doing. It just became unwieldy and unrealistic to write it that way. So the book morphed into something else. But still, for me, the heart of it is this Maud and Jack relationship and what happened to them in the past and who they are as a result of that. Mm -hmm. It'd be hard for you to do something totally different. I mean, you, are you going to miss these characters or are you just putting them aside for a bit and then you'll go back like Suari and revisit them? I, I tell myself I'm putting them aside for a bit and I'll come back. I, right now, I'm just excited. I mean, I, so I wrote three books in the end in this Cormac Riley series and I loved it and I love Cormac, but by the end of those books, my God, he has been through the ringer, you know? And I just, there was no, it didn't feel natural to me to start a new book right then with him because it felt like I would be writing effectively the same book with a little bit of new plot layered on top. You know, it, I wasn't ready to move forward with him as a character and I don't, I still am. And I think in my head, time needs to go by so that he can move into a new stage of his life and then I could come back to him possibly. But um, writing the new book was just this sense of absolute freedom. I can do anything all of these characters are brand new nobody knows anything about them i can go anywhere and do anything and that's been amazing it's been a joy so 
I think I would, I would like to write another standalone before I think about going back to series writing. I think it's just something about the scope of being able to go anywhere that is very oh. fun. Oh, the fresh part sounds absolutely wonderful. So do you know, Emma, that I read your first book because Sulari wrote to me and, and told me to read oh. it. Thank I'm you, fairly Sulari. obedient, so, <laughs> so I did. Um, so how are you feeling about writing in the pandemic? Are you just ignoring it or are you bringing it into the books? What are you doing? I'm, I'm absolutely ignoring it um, because I'm like Derva writing a, a short series and so book four will be the last um, if I do any more, I, I like, like Dervla, I will do a time jump. Um, so the books need to sort of be, even though they can be read as standalones, they need to be read as one as well. So the four books will, will be all in the same world. So if I suddenly have this pandemic, it's like I've, I've lost the world I've created. So I, I did panic for the first, say, two months of the pandemic, <laughs> well, as everyone around the world was. Um, I, I, what am I going to do? I have to change. And I just went, well, I think without saying it, this book is set in uh, 2019 um, and, and we just need to hold, hold that world true. And, and the book, when I finish this series, I, I'm pretty sure I already know what I'm going to write. And funnily enough, it's, a, it's actually historical. Um, so um, I've actually managed to bypass the pandemic for quite some time, which will be good because I'm not ready to write about it yet. Um, I think it'll be a while before I am. I think writing about it when we have no idea how it's going to go is a really dicey proposition. I've talked to a lot of authors about it. Everybody's essentially dodging it. Um, mm -hmm. in the sense that, you know, anything you say about it could be just moronic um, at, down the road here. So if it stays on the fringe or, you know, several authors have kept themselves in 2019, it's mm -hmm. kind of hard. Even if you jump into the future, you could be dramatically wrong unless you're going to write dystopian fiction. So mm -hmm. I think it's hard. Listen, I've asked all the questions. What would you like to ask each other? Um, Suari, so what would you like to ask Emma and Dervla? Let's take turns. Okay, Emma, I'm really intrigued by this mm -hmm. historical. Um, which era? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm on your turf there, Between the Wars. It's ah. actually, I wouldn't say too much, but it's, it's actually inspired by family history. Right. Um, my grandparents um, and... Um, uh, immigrated from Croatia to Kalgoorlie in the 1930s um, uh, and some of their kids were born in Croatia, some were born in Australia and they got caught up in the race riots in Kalgoorlie which I didn't hear about until I was sort of older um, but there was a murder that um, start, sparked off all these race riots and I've just thought oh this is going to be fantastic setting. So this has been in my brain for probably 10 years or so and last year I started thinking about it more and more. I've got a detective, I've got a setup, I've got a house. Um, and I think I need to start saying that's actually going to be my next book rather than that might be my next book. So yeah, it's nice. It's sort of like, like Dervla was saying, it's got that, ooh, possibilities. It's all, it's all nice and juicy and new. <laughs> it's great. Uh, and Dervla, when you left us at Bachacon, you went, where did you go? You went somewhere on the East Coast, didn't you? I went to Virginia. I went to Charlottesville. Yeah, I thought it was Virginia. And is that the is that the book that will be coming out with Harper Collins? Yeah, part of it is set there, and part of it is set in Bar Harbor, where I spent a summer working as a chambermaid. So I kind of know it from that that perspective. Um, yeah, so that was a really interesting experience. I've never really had an opportunity to kind of go on a work a, a book research trip because everything was based in Ireland. So I had no excuses. I knew Galway back the back of my hand. So this was a huge luxury to take. I think I had four days um, in Virginia to just wander and spend time there and listen to people and be in the place. But what I hadn't really taken account of was the fact that I was monumentally jet lagged. I wasn't sleeping at all. So, I mean, I have this Fitbit that counts your sleep. I think I was down to like two hours a night or less. So I was going around, I was like a drunken person walking around the place trying to absorb it was like being in a dream, you know, um, but it was still fantastic. And some little elements of that have ended up. I don't know if I could actually point to a single sentence or, or phrase where I'm repeating something specific, but there's just a feel, you know, there's just a, you, you feel like, you know, somewhere and it's an easier way in than to the story because you're comfortable. You're not just creating it out of um, internet research, which is not the same. So it's yeah. great. What would you like to ask the two authors, Durba? 
I know I would like to ask about craft. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Go. I'm always looking to pick your brains about something. Um, it's the same question for both of you, really. It's do you feel like you found your process and you slip into it? Or do you feel like you're always changing it? And if you're always changing it, is there anything you've learned in the last couple of years that you're kind of, you're, that's really helpful that you're using a lot? Cool. You go first, Solari. Well, my process is not really a process. It's I just start writing in my pajamas with the television on. And so it's not, I don't know that you could call it a process. It's just a habit uh, or, a, or a lack of process. I, with every single book, that's how I do it. It's the metafictions, um, the, the hero trilogy, the Roland Sinclair books. They've all been written that way with no plots, um, just pantsing my way right through to the uh, to the very end. Uh, with every book, I'm terrified it won't work this time. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't get more confident in the method or the process. It's it's how I know how to write and how I feel comfortable writing. But there's a little part of me with every book where I am in fear that it won't work this time because a lot of it is just throwing luck to the wind and hoping that at the end of it, you'll have a novel. Yeah. <laughs> I would do that. I, I was don't know that. You're hearing me just hearing that. <laughs> I was going to use a different metaphor about throwing things on fans. Um, for me, not you. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh God, I don't even know if I've got a process. I have a very, very messy brain. I'm beginning to realise more and more. And I think it's more obvious to realise in a, in, in something like writing, but I've realised it actually applies to my entire life. Um, it's chaos. It's absolute chaos. I don't write linearly like Solari. Um, I, I, I write scenes. I know the scenes sort of pop into my head um, and I want to find out. It's actually quite like you said, Dervla. Um, I want to know more about this character. So when, when, when I wrote Resurrection Bay, it was there's a man sitting in a kitchen holding his dead friend's body I knew the man was, you know, deaf and, oh, what happens? How does he go about? I, I want to know what happens next. Um, but it means the way I write with the chaotic, you know, scenes and everything is that most of my books are actually written, um, uh, I, I retro-engineer everything. So I'll write something, I'll go, I don't know why this is happening. I don't know. Oh, that's why it's happening. Or oh, that means I need to go back and change everything, which then means everything else changes, which means it, it's, it's chaos. And then at some stage, hopefully it all comes together. <laughs> but like Solari, I'm just scared the entire time. I, I don't think anybody who has read your books would ever think that that's how you write, Emma, because your writing is so clean. Like it is so clean, <laughs> tight. I don't, I, you must work so bloody hard and you must do, because if you start from there, how you end up here, I do not know. I, it is chaos and I, I do work so hard. It is ridiculous how many words I write to get, such short books <laughs> it's just it's if I could be if I, I I've actually been thinking I because I, I, I sat down with Dervla well, it must have been last year um yeah, when you're in Melbourne and and I said how do you do it how do you write a book and she said well <laughs> I, I do this and I do this and I and I think that and then I do it and I'm just going and I keep thinking about that that's right I, I think about this and I think about that and that's why you do it and then all the ideas <laughs> So I've been cursing your name and also going, Dervla can do it. She's got Oh, clothes. Emma, I just talk about <laughs> The reality is totally different. You can trust me. You know, I, just, I just make it sound like it's smooth. It is not. Oh, it is right. not. Trust me. That's so, comf uh, so comforting to hear. Yeah. <laughs> Emma, what would you like to ask to finish this up? Yeah, so I, I, have, I have two questions. Um, Dervla, are you going to set a book in Australia? <gasps> oh, the dreaded question. Um, I Sorry. have been terrified to write something in Australia since I got here because I feel like I am so clueless still about Australian culture. And I don't know what the arrogance that makes me think I can write an American book, having only spent a couple of summers there. And I've lived nine years in Australia and I haven't quite felt it yet. I think it's because if I, if I mess up in the States, I'm a long way away. They can't beat me up in person. <laughs> Whereas if I screw up here, I'll hear all about it all the time. Um, I, do you know, honestly, the first time I had a story come to me for Australia was during the bushfires. Mm. And I found a story that I wanted to write. And I think it was because I was angry. And it made me think, 
maybe I need to be angry about something to to find that feeling to write a book but that story is still sticking in my head so I may actually write that um at some point but this other story was just had to be written first you know it was one of those so maybe someday but I am worried about the Austra Australian language and Australian slang because it is so bizarre to an Irish ear um, and I'm not sure I can use it convincingly and I, I go for walks with my with my Aussie friend and she tries to teach me but I think she's bringing me off down a few interesting paths for her own entertainment. So I'm, I'm losing confidence there. <laughs> you need my Russian as... professor. <laughs> yes, as exactly. As long as, right. as long as you put some drop bears in there, you'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. Add in a few drop bears. Exactly, Emma. See, yeah. this is the Australian sense of humor that is so dangerous. Bloody drop bears. <laughs> yeah, so. Okay, my, and actually, you touched on my question for Solari, which is, will you, either directly or indirectly, um, write about the fires because you were so directly impacted by the fires um i think in time it's 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 difficult for me in that i can't write i i did think about writing directly i was approached to write directly uh about the fires but i i live in a small country town um and it's not just my story um, so I, I feel this obligation or this sense of responsibility that it is, it isn't just my story and just my perspective because the entire town went through it. But just on a, on a purely pragmatic level, I think because I'm a novelist, I want a story arc. Um, I want, I want the drama and I want the, uh, the redemption and all of that. And that was there in real life. It was there. But if I was to write it in nonfiction, there would be people who would be cross and I have to live here. So I've abandoned the idea of ever writing a nonfiction about the fires because I want to continue living here and my family wants to continue living here. Uh, but there was, I can't, I can't, this, I can't deny that the fires changed me and it changed everyone around me. Um, and so because of that, I think it will work its way into my work um, indirectly, regardless, uh, because the way I look at things has changed. Um, whether it'll come into a novel, I have, I have thrown around the idea of, uh, of writing a bushfire novel, but I think Derb was going to get there first. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was well, to you it's really been likely. wonderful to spend time with you. I'm watching myself fading away because I haven't figured out how to use the light on my desk, so it's getting darker. <laughs> and while Sulari knows that the dog is not alive, you you two do. This is actually a green screen of uh, behind me. It is my library and it is my dog, but it's a photo, which is why <laughs> I turn green when I do this sort of thing. Barbara, um, I have been looking at that dog the whole way through, absolutely like this, huh? I could not figure it out, and now it all makes sense. <laughs> Do you know what she is? You're going to love this. She's a Shiba Inu, which is an Australian hunting dog, mm -hmm. famous for being not very obedient and also famous for though being small, taking on almost anything of any size. So what you can't see is she really looks kind of like a fox and she has a fabulous tail and she's this wonderful ginger color, but she is in fact, I guess Shiba Inu, now that I think about it, is Japanese, not Australian, I apologize. Um, I'm thinking, I'm thinking that direction. <laughs> well, Australasia. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, if you knew her, you would know that it had to be a photograph because she can't sit still for more than five seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Anyway, thank you for the treat of spending time with you. It's really been great. And we should try to do this on a frequent basis just to keep up. And as I talk to more Australian authors, maybe do you, do you know a range of Australian authors or would it be fun to sort of you know, yeah. mingle you together. We could have mm. Australia com or something of the sort. Mm. Yes, it would be great. Yeah. Why yeah. not? You know, we just learned how to do a webinar on Zoom. Mm. Patrick and I have, have learned how to do it. So I think this technology is so wonderful and it came along just at the right moment, didn't it? Yeah. I mean, this sure pandemic would be really intolerable if we didn't have some way to do something like this. And for you writers, to connect with your fans would mm. be a nightmare. Actually, Solari and I had a great editorial conference on Zoom. It was, you know, completely different than writing her a letter. And um, yes. 
you know, I enjoyed it. And it was I wonderful, it. yeah. Yeah, I and really so, enjoyed it a lot. So let me let me wish you um, getting on with your day. Have a wonderful day. I'm going to go have dinner in that glass of wine that I have passed on at this very moment. So bye and thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you, so Thank you, guys. Bye.